everybody, and uh, thanks for being here. Thanks so much uh, for all of you uh, coming again, uh, because it's been already it's the third day for the We Are Museum conference. So, so today we've assembled a wonderful panel, and I have to say I had uh, the uh, luck to have lunch with uh, all of them. Uh, I certainly hope that uh, the coffee has helped fuel even more conversation than the two-hour conversation we just had together. Um, but uh, apparently, we still have to talk to each other right now. So uh, even though I have plenty of notes for what you said earlier, maybe I can just give you that. Uh, we'll, have to, uh, we'll have to continue, and I'm sure it's going to be quite interesting. Um, the Tech Plus Contemporary Art uh, Can Change the Future of Museums panel is now open, and I'm going to uh, help uh, each of our panelists introduce themselves, of course. So, on my left, uh, first of you, uh, Milia, can you introduce yourself a little bit, please? Hello. Is this one on? Is it on? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm Milia Liimatainen uh, from Kiasma, Contemporary Museum of Art, uh, Helsinki. And um, I work there as a curator for collections. Uh, so basically I do all kinds of uh, stuff related to, to the collection. We, we have... Um, uh, contemporary art collection of about 8,000 artworks. Uh, Kiasma is uh, well specialized or we have quite a few of media artworks in the collection um, and yearly we acquire new works. Uh, uh, Finnish art, also other Nordic art, Baltic art and then international art as well. And um, the thing I was asked to uh, come to be our museum's conference was um, a platform or a site called uh, R17 Plus. Uh, that was a site, a platform made for online artworks. So um, works of art that are made um, um, to be exhibited, exhibited only online uh, via internet. So works that do not exist anywhere outside of the, uh, the internet. And the reason why we decided to, to have a platform like, like this um, was a big exhibition, exhibition project um, we, can't, we currently have. It's called R17, and it's about the, uh, the digital revolution going on um, all over the world, or at least some parts of the world. And um, because of this exhibition, we also wanted to include online art. Thanks so much, actually. And uh, Zane, can you introduce yourself a little bit also to our audience, mm -hmm. please? Because uh, we are very pleased uh, yesterday uh, to be welcome in your space. Well, that, that's thanks to Renat and, and, and Zane. Yes, but uh, I'm the founder of Kim Contemporary Art Center. Uh, and uh, also, I, I, I work in business, so I have my, my own startup in the field of technology. So I guess that's the, that's the reason I'm, uh, I'm here. But when it comes to Kim Contemporary Art Center, um, we are a center focused on uh, emerging artists and uh, almost solely new commissions. Uh, so of course part of that are <laughs> artworks uh, that are more technology related, I guess, uh, than, than, than others. Thanks a lot. Uh, Kaspers. Yeah, I'm head of the art programs at ABLD Charitable Foundation and the foundation is actually a, a multitasking organization. We deal not just with contemporary art, but also with other social programs, including people with hearing uh, problems, kids, uh, like that. And as one of the main projects right now concerning the contemporary art is that the foundation is part of this pr private initiative to build a contemporary art museum here in Riga by private means. And I think it's very interesting for, for us in the foundation to see how contemporary art, art is actually uh, uh, working in a wider network, social network. It's not just the art world, it's not just the museums. It's to do also with education, it's to, uh, to do with, with social programs, with kids, uh, with uh, inabilities uh, and integration and therefore we are also interested in this kind of relationship between new technologies and, and, and art and art education in the future museum. Thanks so much, Kasper. Uh, Tony? Hello everyone, I'm uh, Tony Gillen. I'm senior producer at Imperial War Museums. Um, I'm senior producer of uh, Public Engagement and Learning, which is a new team at the museum 
that um, works across all kinds of creative practices from theatre to performance, the visual arts, uh, other kinds of educational uh, practices to tell stories that relate to museums' collections and programmes, so it's stories about social history and conflict. And I used to be um, producer of the IK Prize at Tate, uh, which is Tate's premier uh, competition or commission for uh, digital creativity, uh, which I set up three, four years ago. Uh, uh, so for all of those tech startups and creative techies that are in the room, uh, I encourage you to go and check that out and keep an eye on future commissions at Tate. Um, yeah. Thanks a lot, Anthony, but not the least because he was also welcoming us last night. Uh, this is Davis. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Davis. I'm from the Tech Hub Riga, and we are the facilitator of the conference. And a little backstory maybe uh, Diane from the Netherlands and the VR Museums Conference dropped in Tech Hub um, one year ago and pitched the idea so that we could collaborate and make this, well, interesting uh, conference, bring, bring together both art and culture and tech. And uh, I said, like, why not? So let's do it. And we are here, finally, a year later. And I am from maybe less art and more tech, because what we're doing at the Tech Abriga is we're supporting early stage tech startups. And we're very narrowed. We discriminate uh, the projects that we uh, are working with. And I can give the, maybe, well, the uh, info on how we're supporting tech and the talk from the tech scene more from than the art. <laughs> Thanks. And your neighbors to Kim, because you're just separated by a courtyard, that you're trying to, you change the name of the courtyard, right? You're trying to change it, the name. Yeah, uh, well, it uh, wasn't made by us, but the Sport at Two Square, we didn't want to make it just another cr creative square. <laughs> there are too many creative squares in the world. But now it's like, I think it's not yet branded and uh, <laughs> not yet registered, but it's the art and technology square Sport at Two. So just a few, few, few blocks from here. It's developing, and uh, those who weren't yesterday at the Star Barbecue, you can uh, join in on the future events that we are holding up for the community. Well, thanks for that, and thanks for the barbecue last night, because I understand it was quite something to try to uh, kill the fire at the end of the day. Uh, there are things about fire extinguishers and very late at night, so let's not uh, get into uh, these kind of details. Um, well, actually, by talking to you a little bit before, um, you seemed very enthusiastic about um, the title of the talk, Tech and Contemporary Art Can Change the Future of Museums. Uh, you seem to have reservations about that title, which is, I think, a good start for a discussion to try to reestablish a little bit the theme of the discussion. So uh, anybody uh, wants to, uh, to comment on the title and your reservations about it? I know Kaspar's had reservations. Did I? With a, with a <laughs> No, I, I, I didn't. I, I, we, I think we were talking about it's uh, tech loves culture or, or culture loves techs, and it's more about this love and hate relationship. And uh, uh, I, I think um, that our it, it, it's some somehow to do. I think we, we started this discussion about that nobody feels anxiety or, or panic when he enters or she enters a, a bookstore or library and sees loads of books and some of them you don't understand and some you will never read. And I think the same is also with, with the artworks, that we don't have to understand each, every single piece on the wall or online. Uh, and that technology is probably, and the IT technologies give us a possibility to, to find the special particular thing you are interested in and probably that's the next step after the museums have reached the wide audience using social networks and all those uh, networking uh, tools uh, people you talked about yesterday and day before yesterday. And then the next question is now when you have reached them, can you, can you serve each particular person in the crowd of the audience uh, taking into consideration his or her specific interests. And that's where nowadays the technologies can help. Tony, it seems like there is a, a very different economy between this, uh, the, the, the startup uh, mentality, I would say, and the art world or museum mentality about scale and stuff. Um, you want to answer? Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, because that's what, what I was thinking of complimenting, meaning I think there's, um, I think 
we were <laughs> we had different opinions, but I think tech definitely doesn't love art uh, or too, uh, doesn't love too much, and 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 the opposite because meaning it has completely different mindsets and scale scalability is definitely one aspect of that. There's in in um, there is if I. Uh, remember it correctly, in macroeconomics there's something called Bommel's cause disease, whereas uh, meaning in any other industry you go for uh, economies of the scale, so you can produce, you know, uh, two, two units in that much time, three units in but less time per one unit, uh, and per four units even less time per unit, and so on and so forth, economies of scale, basic thing. But it takes still the same amount of uh, time to perform Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, you know, and and there's no economies of scale it can do. And the same goes for experience of the art that we were broadly discussing, meaning the average time spent on each artwork is three seconds. So how much of that are we actually getting? <laughs> and is there anything you can scale in that? Not really, you know. So and I think that's part of the reason why tech as, a, as an industry, because it is mostly industry, of course it's also a science and many other things, but tech as an industry, I, I don't think is particularly in, <laughs> interested in the, in the arts uh, field. There's mo not many things uh, you can turn into uh, big successful products or, uh, or, or the amount of money there is not so uh, big, it's not as sexy as uh, other fields of uh, uh, of causes, uh, education, for example, being one of them. So yeah, I'm also skeptical about, about the name, but I know we have <laughs> different I don't know opinions. How much we're <clears throat> uh, disagreeing we, uh, when we were talking before, but I just wanted to start by saying I think we need to demystify the two terms. One is art, and one is tech, and they're two very big umbrella yeah. terms. You know, art is many different things, and technology is just, at the moment, an umbrella term for the types of technology that are new and most of us don't fully understand, but that are doing lots of exciting things and changing societies and how we communicate. What links the two together are objectives. So in, if you think about the art institutions, if the art institution's objective is to try and reach broader audiences and trying to get more people to understand more about their collections or to uh, find out about new types of artworks. There is a lot that technology can do, but it's about starting with those objectives. You come into a space like this where there's lots of really cool and exciting new technologies on display, and they're cool and creative for their own sake, but for a museum professional's point of view, or even an artist's, you've got to approach it with that objective of what do I want to achieve before you even think about technology? and then you'll find the right technology. Mm -hmm. And I think that's how it demystifies it. What, what, what you were mentioning about the different um, economics of the two worlds, I think is really true. The economics of the art world is built on scarcity and control and, uh, and private uh, collectors and traditional institutions of knowledge and expertise. And a lot of that's for good reason, a lot of that's not for good reason in my opinion. But the technology world, which is also fraught with many political problems uh, or social problems, is built on economies of scale. But there are ways that you can achieve the same objectives. So with, particularly when it comes to reach and engagement. I think. Speaking of scale, it seems that um, the, the industrial age was about scalability, as a, as a mass produced scalability. So the same product, but produced a million times while the current digital age is more about the scalability of ultra-personalized services. Mm -hmm. So everyone's Facebook is different, even though there are literally billions of people using it. And it seems very different than the very personalized experience that sometimes museums or art world are trying to install. When you are locked into the room by an artist, it can be the golden toilet or not, uh, if you know the current Guggenheim installation. Um, it seems like sometimes we just address one person at a time, or two persons at a time. I was actually uh, quite uh, amazed by the welcome collection yesterday uh, at Real Museum, telling us that sometimes their programs are just reaching out to two or 10 people. That's quite amazing, these kind of skills. Can it be related in some ways? Do you see, um, how did you approach Kim in that respect? Do you need the scale? Do you want to become the biggest art center in the Baltics? Or do you want to keep at scale? Like, what, what's your... We're like tiny. But uh, no, I think it definitely also depends, uh, meaning 
uh, we are contemporary arts and a uh, tiny non-profit, basically. So museums is completely different story, and I totally agree with, with what Kasper uh, told at the, at the beginning, meaning you are trying, tr trying to serve as many as well as you can by providing that <laughs> particular, uh, you know, um, um, yeah, content uh, they are looking for. Uh, in our case, uh, where I think it is relevant, or at least that kind of, uh, where we use that kind of thinking uh, is uh, in respect to, uh, one, I think, definitely programming. Uh, uh, we do have, uh, for our size, uh, insane amount of uh, exhibitions, probably <laughs> too insane. Uh, in the first year, we did 40 exhibitions. Uh, now 40. we do 40. Yeah. Now we do 20. That's far too much. But then the whole idea was uh, basically to give as many emerging artists as we can the possibility and the reason to exhibit, especially because at that time when we started, there were not many other options. Very few commercial galleries, no Kunsthalle, no museum. So, so there was a reason behind doing it. Now we don't feel, meaning that's changing, so we'll go, <laughs> we'll, we'll decrease um, the, the number. So, and, and that's kind of the aspect of uh, diversity, but, uh, but that's, um, that's, probably, that's probably it. Kaspar, you were telling us that in some ways uh, you are using, your intention for an art center for the new uh, uh, contemporary art museum was maybe to uh, not have a contemporary art museum. Maybe better to link in between uh, oh, things that already exist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think, uh, sure, there is this question uh, whether we need nowadays yet another contemporary art museum and what local museums can actually afford concerning uh, uh, artwork purchases for collections, how they can compete with other big institutions, and it's uh, living and working in Latvia, it sometimes uh, can be annoying that we hear again and again and again, as in examples, uh, MoMA or, or Tate or uh, actually institutions which work with this huge tourist loads who are serving these streams of people and actually can afford not to take care about the local communities quite often. While we understand that the local communities are served and, and hold together by the small institutions which are even never mentioned in, in global art world press. Uh, surely, that's <coughs> surely that's where the um, opportunity of Digital and again to, to, spec yeah. to specify, yeah, yeah. we're talking about digital communications here. We're talking about social media. We're talking about. New That's exactly what like I wanted to continue with. Yeah, yeah. But so you can do that. Actually, yeah, yeah. I have a, I have a question. No, it's free. Yeah. Facebook I Live <laughs> is a. It's, let's just you know the, the technology that we've only had for a few years. That was major broadcast like BBC, huge crews, satellite technology. Now your seven-year-old can broadcast you know from the park. <laughs> that's an opportunity for everyone. And that's exactly what I wanted to say, that do we need exactly this museum of contemporary art, or do we need a, a platform which teaches us this kind of uh, literacy in visual culture, in I, IT networks, how you can use actually the huge amount of bat databases and existing collections already when you are not directly connected with those regions where people have these yeah, huge institutions, but how you can connect to them. I see a clear parallel actually with the tech industry on that. So like, while instead of waiting for Google, basically, to launch uh, Tech Hub Riga as a platform for people to learn about the trade, to learn about startups, to learn about developing, to learn about this entrepreneurial spirit, and link between all the different initiatives uh, in the city or in the country, in the Baltic. Uh, what's, your, what's your take on that, uh, uh, Davis? It seems like you're trying to do the same kind of thing in just a different world, no? Well, uh, we are linking projects together because you can work at home and there can be 20 of you who are working at home, but if you're bringing that all together and you can work side by side and collaborate with each other, it creates synergies so that you're not just working alone. It could make like not creating multiple uh, organizations, you could create like a collaborative, one large organization that would be more effective than just separate 
of them. So I'd like to um, to try to understand a little bit better together uh, this uh, influence of tech on museums and art institutions. Um, Tony, you wanted to like divide a little bit more uh, the activities of the museum, actually the on scene, the the, the front facing, actually what we called uh, uh, what we call like the um, the front office in the software, and the back office, I would say, which would be like how it's used by the organization, and and then also like um, is your take on that? Well, first I'd just like to say I think some of the the the, the um, conflicts that we are finding in this conversation about how very specialist people in, in, in a world like art or museums or history or academics, the <coughs> conflict that they find with using or working with technologists and the broader popular culture, that comes, I think, from a lack of collaboration at the right time. So what museums do, museums like art museums, they collect what they think is important from the present to, pre to, to preserve it for the future and to show it. That takes a huge amount of expertise and a lot of work and should be respected. But what they also do is they design ways of showing those collections or objects for the public. Um, and, that, uh, and then once they've devised an exhibition, for example, right at the end of that process, then they turn around to their marketing teams or their digital teams and then say, help us reach big, big audiences. And then what you end up with people then doing things which doesn't quite work for the art. So a lot of the reservations curators have about like live stream or video is that it doesn't represent the artworks in the way that they were intended by the artists. How do you solve that? Well, you bring the creatives in at the start when you're thinking, right, we're gonna do an exhibition or a performance or a program. You should be working together beforehand. You know, then the design thinking can happen. You shouldn't be then turning around to your digital teams, your marketing teams, after you've finished the product and built it and presented the hours, and then say, right now, find a way of communicating to the world. Wrong stage. Do it earlier, and you'll design exhibitions differently, you'll design your programs differently, and you'll design them in a way that is good for the artwork, but also works for the way in which these technologies work, the way in which these online cultures uh, work. Uh, so it's bringing in early, and then what my last thing is, so once we achieve that, then the next stage, I think, is curators being the facilitators, or maybe being called producers instead, and bringing in text to work at the beginning with artists. And then you'll, you know, artists currently work quite isolated, you know, and that's fine, the artists have creative visions, but if they work, like I said this yesterday, a little bit more like how films are produced, they're more collaborative processes. You bring in a cinematographer, a director. If artists were working more collaboratively with museums who are going to present their works, but also with people who have the skills with which to present them on new platforms through new technologies, you'd create different kinds of art, and then you'd present it in different kinds of programs. And then you'd, you'd resolve those differences before they occurred. Zane, I, um, I, had, uh, I was feeling very smart by trying to ask you if you had thought about technology into your space, putting cables, putting projectors. But you said that basically you brushed it off saying, yeah, of course, because, well, current art is actually into these kind of things. But the most interesting thing is that you told me how you were using technology inside of the organization itself. Um, yeah, no, we have a long way to go. I Meaning, uh, I don't think we're by by any means a, a, a great example, but but I think that um, um, first of all, I totally uh, agree, uh, and I also agree with Kaspers, who says that a lot of uh, discussions around you know tech in the arts <laughs> or in the museum industry is concerned with uh, the the questions of you know kind of uh, public engagement. So everybody is discussing, so how much uh, Instagram followers do we have or, or how much likes do we get? And that's uh, f fine, but that's like the, the, <laughs> the most kind of the boring, I think, or, or kind of the, the most boring part, uh, part of it. I think that the discussion that we're not often having is exactly at this um, back end side of what happens within the organizations. and how much tech is part of, of that world. And, and uh, for museums, it's definitely a big topic when it comes to collections and conservation and many other things that that's not part of uh, contemporary art center um, kind of problematics. But one thing that uh, I definitely see a, a big problem is, is when it comes to management and administration, which is saying there's plenty of uh, 
uh, of m museum employees and arts institution employees uh, who don't know what is a Google shared document, you know, or everybody <laughs> of us knows uh, what it means to invite uh, uh, people for openings, you know, majority still use Excels and then they are recreated every time. And, and, and then the question about fundraising, meaning like every normal, every tiniest uh, business company, any startup uh, would start with basic customer CRM database, customer relationship management. <laughs> so where you, you, you fix like whom you invited last time, did the person come or no? Or the last example I used, it's like, we just had uh, our eight year birthday and <laughs> invited quite many. Uh, had 3,000 people that came, but invited one and a half thousand people, and and uh, of course, uh, how we were initially were planning was to have 20 sheets of of names, and then uh, we started counting how much time it would take and how big queues would we have if we need to find if two if two if two girls at the entrance of uh, of our gallery will have to find by last name and then check and then. So, so extremely practical things, and there's like tons of softs for that. <laughs> you know, you take iPad, you find the main, you click, and then it, you know you save. You know who came, who didn't, and not that it's somewhere in the papers. So all I wanted to say, I meaning I think that museums and arts institutions would gain a lot by, <laughs> by just exchanging <coughs> once in a while information with startups or any companies asking, so what CRM databases do you use? <laughs> How do you manage your human resources? How do you manage your invoicing? How do you manage your, um, I don't know, donors? Meaning these are like basic things. It's like, I can't tell you how basic that is, but I think we lose a lot of time. We lose a lot of human resources. People are burning out in arts institutions, even though you would think like, okay, meaning when it comes to the numbers, it should be all right. But we are like using, you know, pre-ancient, ancient tools uh, in 21st century. Davis, I see, I? You, yeah, yeah. I, I see you so smiling because it seems like the startup mentality is about if someone else has already built a good product that is way faster than what we have now, let's just use it, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, <laughs> the uh, startups are about solving organizations' problems. And also, when I do a little tour in the two floors of startups, many of the startups do not uh, attack the cultural, or the cultural organizations, so to say. In particular, they're solving the problem for many of kinds of organizations. It means that uh, museums and art galleries should take advantage of it. There are many there are super software that saves you resources, and that's like also the part at Tech Hub, that many of the startups in particular are in the so-called business-to-business field. And why is that so? Because if you can save other organizations' resources, mostly time and money, then eventually you will buy that product. And if I can save your resources, then you will eventually buy my product <laughs> and uh, apply to your business. Yeah, I just yeah. wanted to comment that I totally recognize um, uh, like your problems like uh, uh, digital devices and, and different kinds of program on the uh, kind of um, administrative and, and organizational level. Uh, I think we too have, have similar kinds of like uh, lacks um, or we're lacking stuff like uh, in the... Uh, we're, we're, we're basically lacking devices to make things. For, for uh, example, like um, touring exhibitions um, that we make or exhibitions that you plan uh, in space, uh, which is somewhere else, like not in the, uh, uh, in the museum where you work for, um, it would be essential to have, uh, to have a, some kind of, I mean, I know the, uh, the technicians working in the museum, they do have all kinds of 3D uh, planning stuff, but also for us uh, curators, it would be essential to, to have a program to kind of control the space, whereas now uh, it's all like, mm -hmm. Um, printing and clipping, and that's fairly old-fashioned. But then I also uh, I wanted to comment on Tony's um, earlier comment about the uh, like um, taking on the digital uh, people, uh, connecting them with the curators, and, and like on a really early stage, um, and the curators working as um, more like maybe producers in that um, particular phase. Um, I totally agree with you, but then I also think that there's a really strong need, like I feel that there should be uh, an artist 
on this panel right now because I, I totally feel that agree. <laughs> I feel that there's a really really strong need uh, among the artists to connect uh, with the people working on tech. Um, like, uh, yeah, they do projects with museums, and then then like we are able to connect them with with uh, with other people working on tech. Mm. But they are doing projects uh, by themselves as well, and uh, yeah, they they uh, they would really the really interesting thing with this panel so far is that we're not talking about creating new technologies. Actually, the tech guys have got loads of technologies, you know. It's actually about the culture of museums because it's such broad churches with differing objectives or perhaps not always working together very well. I think it's about find us organizing better who mm -hmm. we work in museums. Mm -hmm. uh, and whether it be, I mean, the certain teams of museums, the kinds of teams I work, you know, are much better at reaching out and working with tech people, but that's because they're public facing. But I think the culture inside is better and we talked a little bit more between departments we find those technologies which are not kind of about communications and not for the public that you might might make your work better that actually do already exist. So a lot of the problems it may be a cultural problem or it may just be the good old fashioned funding problem because things like CRMs and CAD 3 designs and all that kind of stuff, it exists and you know, it wouldn't take very much to speak to software companies to tweak them so that they work for your purposes. So it's a, I think it's a cultural change issue, it's maybe a funding issue, um, and it's certainly an internal collaboration issue, not so much a how do we collaborate with the techies. Techies have a lot of technologies, it's not about that would work for us. I think it's a yeah. culture change on <laughs> No, I can, and I think in, in, in this respect, I think that the, the states uh, can help as well. Uh, I, I think that. Uh, well, we tend to idealize the the Estonian <laughs> kind of experience in in this in this field, but uh, nevertheless, meaning um, electronic voting or e-health solution, <laughs> meaning um, government invests in a solution, tech mini CRM or whatever, that would be useful for whole loads of uh, of institutions and help them, you know, onboard them, help to implement. And then the companies who develop them oftentimes use it as a pilot, meaning like a country as a pilot, to take it to wherever, the case of e-health in, in Estonia, to <coughs> famous Qatar now, and other countries, Probably meaning. Culture yeah. Well yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kaspar? Uh, I think it's uh, also about this uh, topic uh, Tony talked about earlier. I think it's uh, that for more or less good reason uh, museums can be compared with hospitals. They have very strict hierarchical order. You have doctors and you have nurses and then you have uh, people, care, care personnel. And the, the trouble is that actually the patient is uh, in the hospital is treated by all three or four segments simultaneously. While in the museums actually the departments most often work separately. And the question is that if you are a conservator or if you are a researcher, you actually live in a, I have full respect for art researchers or, or researchers in general, because in this age, they are able to focus on one thing for a long time, but at the same time, they are disconnected with the surrounding world. And I think what is interesting that uh, uh, in the museum programming or product development, I mean exhibitions or educational programs, actually that the museums should open up. And there are regulations which museums have to stick to, just like in hospitals, you have to put the white coat when you go to the patient or you don't use uh, the same shoes. Uh, but at the same time, this kind of mentality of startup scene concerning the uh, model planning and that you can, if the project is not working, you, you can know that only through beta versions, museums don't use beta versions enough, uh, they, they, they don't see their long-term projects as put together as a Lego where you can always take some parts out which don't work in one or two years. Uh, oh, so, this is another topic, not just the tools, but also the philosophy or, or, or the environment which is in, in the startup scene so developed could be taken over in some cases also in museum environment. Call out to all museum directors in the world, 
what I took from yesterday and today is actually, as well as all these technologies that we could maybe use in different ways, actually what, how tech companies work is very collaborative and, you know, they've talked about scrum working and agile project management and sprints and all this. What would be really useful is if museum directors actually brought, brought in some people to uh, look at how organizations work on projects. So kind of like project management <laughs> More training. organization sociologists, I think that would be, that would helpful. be helpful. Because actually you mentioned hospitals being the same as museums. And uh, if we look at the hospital, you said the hierarchy. Well, it's very clear that the patient is lowest. Because actually the institution of an hospital is extremely violent towards the body of the patients. And nowadays, it seems like we're trying to put back the patient into the center of the problem, which is like, it comes from him, and then everybody's helping. A little bit like most museums, not most museums, but a bunch of museums, we are sorry to say that, they put the visitor at the lowest rank possible. It's like, oh yeah, by the way, we open sometimes. Oh yeah, by the way, you can come, but don't touch, but don't look too much. But please do this, please do that. And please come to our workshop at 4.30. <laughs> so in a way, the startup mentality of putting user first, we could be, use that in hospitals, and we could use that in museums, I guess, too. Um, ah. All respect to the <laughs> users, but I still have huge respect to what museums are doing uh, in the backstage, that means the research, the conservation, and that's uh, when we are talking about new technologies, we can't even imagine what kind of technologies are used nowadays in conservation. It's like a spaceship uh, agency, you know. Uh, they can make wonders with, with those wrecks of artworks or whatever historical uh, archetypes. But I think that in, in, in the hospital, more and more we, we see that we have to see the illness in its complexity or as a holistic thing. And, and this subdivision of museums, we have natural history museum, we have history museums, and we have, apart from history museum, we have war museums, you know, as if it's not a part of history. And then comes art museums or medical history museum. And what I find interesting and where I see this kind of big future for technologies how you put these stories and narratives and facts together in database which can help you understand the singular piece in any of the collections using the, the archives and the research done by each of the museum uh, to serve each other. And that will help for me as a, uh, as a, as a curator, you know, to, to use uh, uh, what has been done already because we spend so much time He's going through the archives, through the databases. We don't even have uh, or very few search engines which are specific. Uh, I mentioned this, for example, if, if you are a, a fashion designer and you are interested in shoelaces, how do you find in art museums paintings where you can see shoelaces? It's, it's in, almost impossible. Or if I... I'm interested in films where I can see the house or the street on which I live. How can I do that? And this is where I think uh, what, what is an urgent need for me as, as a practitioner in a museum Milia, environment. Milia, you wanted to comment, but it reminds me totally of the Jewish Museum in Berlin presenting yesterday their own platform to gather together databases by all kinds of different institutions and researchers. And actually, I think you explained pretty well why uh, this project exists and how, why the Jewish Museum is involved in that. Mm -hmm. But please, Milia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I, um, I think there, will, there is and there definitely will be a need uh, uh, for the audiences to go and look for really specific information. But then, as you said, uh, on the other hand, I think there is a need for this kind of um, uh, holistic experience as well, uh, like the ability to be able to connect things uh, with, with each other. We're talking about uh, like uh, how I don't know how kind of like a human brain is is um, I don't know if it's being built up or if it's just the way that we are used to thinking, like you you categorize stuff in order to be able to kind of take it in. And I think the way we have arranged our museums is, is based on this kind of thinking as well. You need to have specific sectors uh, on each and everything to be able to kind of um, control the huge amount of 
uh, material and in information around you. Um, but I think there is a big trend towards this um, holistic thinking and you can also see, for example, uh, in education. In Finland, for example, they are now, um, uh, instead of a, a specific subjects, they are moving towards this um, uh, more this uh, experience-based uh, education where you take uh, one thing and then you kind of, yeah, yeah, and then you like uh, think about that from different angles. I just, want, I just wanted to say that the, uh, yeah. we, we keep flipping from talking about kind of like public facing technology uses like communications and then the, the, the back of house technology supports that might help us do our jobs. And I think there is a difference because one, the kind of, and you and I, Martin, talked about this quite a lot in the past few days. A lot of the technologies you use when you're trying to explore art and collections for the public engagement is free anyway. It's social media, and it's not bespoke to museums. You know, on the, when you're talking, when you're looking to the public, you're going to use what they're already using. That makes sense. The hard thing is a lot of these technologies you're talking about, things that might be specific to conservation, science or curating, um, they're a little bit more bespoke, and therefore harder in the commercial sense because when you're public facing there's lots of opportunities to commercialize and make money to pay for it it's very it, behind the scenes just takes investment if you want a bespoke technology that can you know uh, AI that can read paintings and, and, and authenticate it that needs a lot of investment and it's figuring out how you can maybe make it public to then get a commercial opportunity that's where the trick is you know <laughs> Funnily enough, uh, that is, it seems like uh, Facebook, for example, was focused on these front-facing users, but is now investing in Facebook at work, for example, mm -hmm. that is completely internal. And what is the uh, valuation of Slack, uh, the, the software that you can use to work within an organization? I think it's four billion? I think, no, it's, it's uh, like a Facebook uh, yeah. way of communicating. So I think it's Facebook for business or the new tool that they're announcing. Yeah, they yeah. also want to compete on that. But Slack evaluation, I think, is something for four billion. So actually, there is a lot of things to be done on this uh, from these uh, internal facing kind of uh, companies who are focusing on the tools, on the organization tools, trying to help people, not only the front facing. Of course, at we are museums, we are talking a lot on these front facing tools. But it's also very, uh, very good to talk about, uh, about these. Um, I wanted to, uh, to ask you something about, uh, about maybe how to get the best help <coughs> from tech into the art world, but money, actually. <laughs> and actually, <laughs> right? Elephant in the room, exactly. And uh, Zane, you, you have a strong opinion about uh, the, the Silicon Valley, at least the American Silicon Valley uh, environment, and uh, the fact that they don't value art that much. Well, no, we were, uh, yeah, I, I think it's just, uh, I know a bit more about U.S. case and, of course, U.S. funding for our arts and culture completely different from European. Also, art education is a completely different model. And and uh, I just initially straight away objected to the title. I say if we look at the Silicon Valley and techies uh, from U.S., then the big problem currently for U.S. arts institutions is the fact that Techies don't give money to to the arts. They they don't uh, support arts institutions. Um, all New York institution relies on old Jewish uh, philanthropists basically. And now when they're dying out, it's a big question: uh, what will happen in next uh, uh, ten ten years? So um, in that sense. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm quite uh, skeptical about the natural interest uh, uh, of techies. And, and then comes the question of the funding, meaning <laughs> because you are competing for their attention and that their attention is in, in major opportunities in business <laughs> and in science and in many other fields. You know, the demand for ID specialists is, is insane, even corporations. <laughs> are going insane trying to recruit. Imagine, you know, jumping into that battle um, and getting their attention. So um, so I, I see there are two opportunities in the case of US. You would have uh, major philanthropists like Michael Bloomberg, uh, who would say, like, okay, I think this is so important. I love arts, I love tech. I will contribute uh, this much million to develop this thing for a whole set of of, uh, of institutions or, or, or so, or, or then in the case of Europe, I, I think that, uh, yeah, we have to, governments have to think of the complex solutions <laughs> for 
uh, whether it's for all museums or all, you know, like for, for, for sets of problems, uh, because uh, especially when it comes to backup uh, aspects. Uh, Let's turn to your similar. neighbors then. Uh, Davis, can you pledge that if you successfully invest in a unicorn, which has the startups that get more than a billion dollar valuation, you will bring some, back some money for Kim. Can you pledge oh, that? Yes. <laughs> could you yes, pledge that uh, right now? <laughs> yes, well, that I could. <laughs> but uh, talking about maybe the, not the techies not going after arts initially, uh, we were talking in, at lunch also previously that uh, previously it was the thing that new entrepreneurs started building their products for two years and then they looked for their solutions and what, what are the customers that they solve the problems with. And now it's turned upside down. So first you tackle the problem and then you find the solution on top of that. And it turns out that, well, techies, well, either they're not targeting culture or they don't see problems or they don't uh, engage with culture. So they solve problems elsewhere and then they uh, see where their solutions can be applied. And some of them can be applied to arts and museums. Some of them are just uh, for the museums. But mostly, it's not in its broader sense. So first, you tackle the problems for someone else or, or yourself. And if you are a techie, then you don't see the cultural problems in the second. Well, I would like first. to hear from you in a year after this event, when the startups and uh, the uh, different uh, incubated uh, organizations that you have also here, like uh, Take Up Riga, um, when, after this conversation, will they have noticed any kind of problems that they can solve in the art world? So uh, we look at, we're forward for that because in one year we have to get back together and try to understand that. Uh, I think uh, I read a while ago one explanation why techies are, are not investing in art or why they don't collect art is that the whole mind space in, in which they work is completely different from this uh, art market and 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 con and and yeah uh, art environment that uh, first of all uh, this uh, sharing is new having concept is completely uh, excluded from art world it's kind of like I, I buy and then I put it aside either to speculate or to, to have it in my bedroom or to raise awareness by donating it to the museum or giving it in loan. Uh, secondly, this uh, uh, open source mentality mm. is, is something which is also unfixed or it's, it, it can be changed while museums deal with copyrights, with perfect uh, protocol how the artwork should be exposed, where it shouldn't be uh, shown or how it shouldn't be interpreted. Uh, there are lots of dogmas in the in the art world. We 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 stick to them because that's the only survival mechanism, kind of like of the art market. Uh, we we don't even have op open price databases. You know, you never know what that painting uh, really uh, was paid, uh, w w what somebody paid for it. You know or whether that's a real price you see in, in auction house, whether that was the owner who actually put those high bids. So, so this kind of hidden uh, mythology of the art world uh, is highly un, un, unattractive for, for techies who actually put everything Shady on the world. table. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. art galleries are notoriously famous for not even using Excel sometimes and just having a, pr I mean, the number of work of arts where they don't ex exactly know if they have it or not, they do where it's like located. In, like in the movies uh, yeah. about gangsters, they just write down with hands a price and move it over this little sheet of paper. You I, I have to mention Excel, there. you need computers, <laughs> so it's stored immediately. You know? I have to mention there, Tropy.co, uh, who's a company doing uh, a, a a back office solution for art galleries because they saw just a mess and they're like, can't you use just something that is like clean and <laughs> try to do that? Uh, Amelia, uh, that seems absolutely perfect with, with, uh, with um, sorry, uh, what Caspar just mentioned. Um, you have people who want to invest in something that is still seen by all the others and still accessible. Well, they should just buy internet-based art and leave it online. What do you think of that? 
Like, why do we then collect it and why do we? Yeah, they yeah, just should buy invest it. in you, yeah. the things you have, actually. Yeah. Um, well, I think the thing is why we, um, we wanted to do the, uh, the online platform or the online site. Um, the important aspect of it was that um, basically almost all the works on the site are in our collection as well. So the works were bought by us, they will stay with us. Um, uh, for let's see how long, hopefully really very long, but we'll see how the, uh, the technologies uh, kind of go forward. Um, but the idea was that um, we wanted to create a place for the works so that our audiences would find them. Yeah, they are all over the web and, and you can go and see them like without our site as well. Um, but I don't think that many people, well, we were actually discussing about this uh, on Monday, that will people find them or not, but... Um, <laughs> I'm sure there are people who will find them without us too, uh, but still I think there are many people who will not find them. Um, and we wanted to uh, provide a way for them to, to get contact with this art. And then we also were talking about today with Tony um, about this uh, need for curating content. Like you do have uh, things um, everywhere, but I think it's a bit easier when you have uh, someone who has done some pre-selection or someone who has like framed the works in a certain way, maybe collected um, works around a certain theme in a certain place. So, so these were the reasons why we decided to uh, uh, go, go on collecting online art. Which is exactly the same problem that Facebook has at the moment. Is it uh, an edited or an unedited uh, stream of information and uh, so-called fake news and stuff? Well, I, we've reached the point where we're talking about fake news. I think that's about time that we get to the questions from the audience, if you want. So, so that should work. That that works. So, any questions from uh, our audience, please? Come on. Okay. So, Anna from the Latvian National Museum of Art has to ask a question now. So, I'm going to pass her the microphone. That's fine for you. Oh. Sorry. And so, yes, this uh, startup who does the. Um, this, uh, this sketch box yeah. uh, is accessible here, actually. And thanks Absolutely. for providing us with that. Yes, thank you very much. Very interesting discussion. Well, I was finding a lot of similarities with the description of the internal organization, art organization. <laughs> and uh, I was more wondering, like, uh, that the generations are recently changing in the art institutions as well, because it's still very exciting to work there, even if the tech part of the work is not so uh, updated. Um, my, uh, I was more wondering inside, like, um, what we can do and who should take this initiative actually to start to change this, like, because uh, as a, me, like, I'm representing kind of the younger generation that is working in the art institutional field, I totally understand we try to struggle for some new uh, softs and uh, the same Google Docs and, and another uh, opportunities to, to manage better our internal work, but uh, what to do with the others? That is my... <laughs> Tony, you seem yeah, to have so, a lot of uh, energy. So who should take this initiative to oh. convince the others? Uh, should it be us uh, going there and trying to struggle, or from where should it come? <laughs> uh, no, no, I think there's a couple of uh, possibilities. Yes, uh, I, yeah, I think uh, one, and again, we're talking about European case where funding um, almost 100% yes, comes I... from, from state and, and so does structure, so to say. Uh, but uh, one thing is uh, you can create a, a, a group of, of course, not formally like boards like you would have in, in, in the US, but like ad advisory board on, on these questions, meaning invite a couple of techies, meaning get them involved on a monthly basis to help you go function by, by function and see, okay, we can borrow this from the here, this from there, this is how we do it. That's, uh, that's one opportunity. Second opportunity, uh, of course, is, is war, uh, to talk with the ministries of, of culture, otherwise to establish, and there are similar initiatives. And I'm not, meaning I'm not, uh, it's definitely not something that I'm, meaning ministries have tons of things to do, but. But, but again, uh, th there can definitely be additional efforts or if a couple of institutions go and say, listen, how about we 
form this task force that helps us with these particular um, questions. And, and then the, the third option, of course, is, uh, is, is to create position within the current institution who is uh, responsible for. Meaning digital transformation is a huge topic in, uh, in, in, in business as well. <laughs> so um, they are sometimes creating specific roles who just go department by department and see what we can do better. Tony, do you uh, still have enough energy to try to put change, or are you already looking for, are you looking for a job at Google instead of museums? <laughs> are you bailing out on us? No, I, I love working in cult the cultural sector, um, uh, but I just yeah. think there needs to be a, a, a big cultural change. I do believe in state-funded cultural institutions. I believe they exist for all of us, and that they should stay that way, but money's reducing, and museums need to wake up. We should, of course, great philanthropists who give money are welcome, great, but you can't just sit and wait or, or, or whinge and, and cry when people die off and they stop giving you money. <laughs> Tech startups are businesses at the end of the day, and you've got to respect that. You, you, you've got a livelihood to make, yeah? You want to be successful. You know, don't whinge that they're not giving you money. Give them a reason to work with you, either in a collaborative sense where you can both do something together that works for both of you, or give them a reason to want to give you money, you know? I think collaboration with, you know, people like, I, I don't work in IT, I'm not a techie. I work in, I used to work in like digital side content for online. Now I'm working on public programming, which is a bit of both. But I do work with online companies and, you know, often looking for funding with them. And the reason why is because there's scale, there's marketing opportunity, there's commercial opportunity. But if, 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 if there's internal stuff, like internal systems, that there's no investment from the state to help you transform internally, yeah. Then maybe there needs to be some collaboration internally and externally. You know, if I'm working with a big tech company to deliver yeah. a big public-facing project that has commercial capacity, maybe they can also help you fund something internally as well. I think we need to be understand the the change in the in the economy. Of of course, fight to maintain public funding, but also look for the uh, revenues in a more constructive way. Understand how. Um, tech companies work. They want to talk to audiences, so sure should yes. we for other reasons, but if we can make that collide, then we can look at funding and getting them to help with us. Um, that's all I have. Yes. Well, okay. this will conclude our panel then, I and uh, okay. Davis, thank you so much. Tony, thank you so much. Kaspars, thank you so much, and we have to mention that the uh, ABLV, for Charitable Foundation, is one of the main supporters of Free Museum and Tech Love Sculpture. I'd like to thank you very much for your help in getting organized these three days. Of course, Dana, thank you so much also uh, for welcoming us at Kim uh, yesterday night. And uh, Kim is... We're waiting for the money. Oh, and we're waiting, and we're waiting for the money, right? Exactly. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and Milda, uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, just a quick note, of course, uh, the startup scene is still going on, so you can still ask them questions and stuff. But we have also live demos. So at 4.30 in the garden, you have the live demo of the spray printer, which is an amazing graffiti uh, thingy. Uh, just look at that, it's just, it's perfect. I can't draw, so that's just, that's just perfect. Uh, of course, uh, at 5.30 also, a live demo, we'll have a streaming for the National Gallery of Ontario uh, by Reblink. So that's definitely something amazing that we're going to have. So that's at 5.30, the live demo. Um, and we also have uh, the mash machines uh, that are quite cool, so uh, that you can try in the garden to get to break the ice, thanks to music. I would encourage you to try that. Thanks very much for attending this presentation and please warm applause for our panelists.